Al, the TAC program is one of the biggest OER initiatives in the world. Can you tell us a little bit about how it came about? Well, uh, when President Obama was elected, he did something uh, quite remarkable, which is he uh, uh, decided that the Department of Education's uh, senior positions with regard to higher education would be staffed by people who had experience working with community colleges and community college students. And the leadership that he brought to Washington, D.C., decided to approach uh, federal grants in an entirely new way. And the fundamental idea behind the reform was to make sure that when the public invested in creating learning materials, that the public would get free access to those learning materials and also be able to improve them over time. And I know, Hal, that this program started in the context of a downturned economy and had some other sort of structural components that we're looking at getting colleges working with industry partners, introducing not only OER, but online learning and education technology, and it seemed like a very innovative program. Timing was very important to this program uh, for the reasons you identified, um, the downturn in the economy and the great need for education and training. But the timing was also right for another reason. And that's because uh, for 30 years, the federal government had been making a mistake in the way it contracted for a wide variety of goods and services, in particular digital goods and services. It was the only category of goods and services that the government bought that the government didn't own after it bought it. So over and over again, the government, the federal government, and also state and local governments were in a situation where they were being asked to pay licensing fees, essentially to repurchase the digital goods and software that they had paid for years earlier. And uh, President Obama's election and the change in philosophy in Washington uh, resulted in a lot of uh, people coming to Washington who understood how technology works and who understand that the public can actually own the software that the public pays for. Paul, you've uh, been responsible over the last four years for working directly with the grantees, with support from several foundations, to help them achieve the vision that uh, was, was designed into this program. And it's a very big leap for many of these organizations to do things in an entirely different way. Uh, how, is the, how does the implementation match up with the vision uh, that was built into the design of this program? Yeah, I think, Hal, it's a great question in the sense that it's a large initiative, almost $2 billion released over four years affecting more than 700 colleges across the entire United States. And for many of them, the open requirement was a new requirement. And that requirement in, in, involved then putting in place a set of uh, policies in some case, a set of workflows and changes to the design strategies, and even a, a new um, approach in terms of how the, the technology would be used to develop and deliver education. It sounds like the instructors in the TACT program uh, got a lot more freedom to do things in different ways, but also had a lot more responsibility. What effect does that have on instructors when um, they are invited to either create or use open educational resources? I think this whole aspect of the faculty engagement with this process has been fascinating. For many faculty, they've authored materials autonomously, almost like lone rangers for years. And now for the first time, they actually have the opportunity to look at existing resources that are available in the form of OER and draw on those resources to help their curricular development activities. And they also, for the first time, are realizing that the resources they create will become something their peers see, something the public sees, and something students see. So there's a bit of a peer review process there that I believe raises the quality of the resources over time. When we surveyed the landscape of uh, community colleges across the country uh, at the beginning of this program in 2009, we realized that many colleges were creating or, or asking students to purchase materials that were essentially similar or identical across a great variety of yeah. programs. Um, in other words, the government was paying for the same thing mm -hmm. 
over and over again, year after year, often paying for these things through financial aid budgets, mm -hmm. where the student was given financial aid, but a lot of their financial aid was absorbed by uh, these uh, redundant costs. Are we able to take uh, costs out of the system by uh, encouraging the creation of material that can be shared across institutions? I think this is one of the biggest both existing benefits and also opportunities. When you look at the TACT program, it's clustered typically into five main areas of development, manufacturing, health, energy, transportation, and IT. Those tend to be the high growth industry sectors that colleges are creating academic programs for. The ability to look at existing resources, even from round to round, you know, the round three and four grantees can look at resources developed through round one and two and reuse those resources and, and leverage them to build out additional curricula or even stacked and latticed credentials in new and innovative ways. And when the material is open, one of the things you've been overseeing is these relationships that are developing between colleges and local employers mm -hmm. um, so that the skills that are taught in community colleges uh, more closely match the uh, uh, openings or needs that the employers may have. Um, what role does open education resources play in uh, fostering those relationships between employers and uh, educators? I think this is a really interesting area that in my view is still at the beginnings of having um, sort of manifested its greatest potential. I th do think that there's the opportunity for colleges and industry and intact is playing this opportunity out to des design curricula that meets the needs of the employers and also provide students with the kind of education they need to advance themselves personally and advance their career. And the openness of the curricula allows industry to see that the curricula does match their needs. And, and I think the other exciting opportunity for industry is that the OER developed through this process can be used not only by the college to provide a, a credentialed education for students, but can actually also be reused by industry to meet its own professional development needs of workers. One, one of the uh, exciting uh, aspects of the uh, ability that students have to uh, use these materials is that they get to keep them. Uh, share with you uh, when we put this program together was uh, a recognition that I, sh I had and I shared with others that, struck, that always struck me as bizarre even when I was a community college student 40 years ago that at the end of every semester you see these big signs on college campuses telling students to sell their books back to the bookstore and that always struck me I mean if you're in the education business how counterintuitive that is mm -hmm. If the books are so unimportant uh, that the students don't need to keep them, then why are they being assigned in the first place? With open education resources, students get to keep their books and they build a library that they can rely on as they move forward in their academic career. So when they're taking computational biology as a senior, they can go back and look at their statistics uh, textbook because they still have it. Sure, and I think how one of the the biggest things coming out of TACT is the, the Skills Commons repository where not only the textbooks a student in a particular college might have received go, but really all of the OER developed by all colleges in the program are being uploaded and stored in that place for everyone to access. Students, faculty, even the public. I think it's in general with OER content. There are some specific aspects of the TACT program that administrators have to take into account in order to fulfill their grant requirements. But in the context of openness, I would suggest that those strategic considerations are general and applicable across any OER initiative. Yes, and, and the main uh, um, uh, regulatory reform that was made in the TACT program was the insertion of a new requirement that all of the intellectual property produced with the grants had to be released with an open uh, intellectual right. property right. license. 
and that had never happened before. Right. That that was the uh, uh, the the new reform. And the thing I like about that reform, Hal, is that that reform enables the reuse of those resources across the entire group of colleges involved with TAC and beyond. And I also think that it stimulates some innovation. And I know you've been involved with looking at examples of successful TACT stories. And are there some that you'd like to highlight as being exemplars? As for uh, individual examples of uh, OER that are um, making a difference in uh, people's lives, uh, we're seeing in the TACT program uh, examples of that that help students uh, get jobs in healthcare professions, in uh, engineering professions, in aerospace professions. One example that uh, struck me was uh, in one of our programs in the Midwest where uh, a, an open magnetometer was created to help students understand uh, properties uh, uh, essential to a great number of uh, high-tech manufacturing occupations. And that magnetometer became such a valuable tool for the students in those programs that it's now being used by local employers in improving their manufacturing processes. So we're seeing um, the ability of the creation of open education resources to, have, uh, to create a bridge between students, problems that need to be solved by industry, and, and, uh, and more modern industrial manufacturing processes that are needed to revive our economy. Paul, when we inserted this requirement for open licenses in the federal tax programs, it had never been done before by the federal government. Um, uh, what has been the response, though, from other funders as you've led the implementation of this initiative? Is anybody else interested in this model? I think this model's grown enormously, Hal, and I think funders everywhere are now thinking about public funds resulting in a work that the public should have access to as a fundamental principle around providing funds for the development of education resources. Yes. This public policy reform uh, simply requires us to modernize our purchasing procedures so that taxpayers get more value for the taxes that they already pay. Yes, and, and I think that we're not only are we modernizing purchasing, but we're making the best use of technology. We know that you can create and disseminate resources at almost zero cost. And typically we've placed artificial scarcity constraints on those distribution and production methods and, and created barriers associated with accessing them requiring people to pay. And I think this policy removes some of those artificial scarcity barriers and enables abundance. Uh, the phrase you use, artificial scarcity, um, can you describe what that means a little bit in depth? Uh, uh, why is the scarcity uh, necessary? Who benefits from the scarcity? I think that the uh, scarcity has been a long tradition in the software industry where we've seen that it's possible to create digital goods and then of course distribute and make copies of those digital goods for almost zero dollars but people want to recover the cost that they've invested in creating that digital asset. In the case of public funds, it's the government that's made the public investment. There's really no reason to provide that or to insist on a, a constraint that implements artificial scarcity when really you want the abundance to happen. You want the resource to be distributed as widely as possible and used as much as possible because that maximizes your return on investment. And so I think that this is new thinking being brought to the table made possible by technology, but an acknowledgement that perhaps the traditional practices of artificial scarcity and how technology has been delivered aren't appropriate for the public sector. Paul, as you know, when we were designing the TACT program, uh, we were in the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. And one of the main goals was to make sure that we were developing materials that was not only open and free, but materials that would lead students as rapidly as possible into uh, high-wage jobs in fast-growing industries. The OER that we created was all, is all targeted at helping students develop those career pathways and enter those high growth industries. Uh, uh, why does it matter 
that the program was, uh, the OER program was nested inside this uh, larger objective. And what does that mean for the future of these resources? I think the larger objective is a really important component to this whole initiative, Hal. It's not enough to do OER just for the sake of doing OER. I think that they need to be contextually situated to provide a, a real benefit. And so in this case, requiring the, the colleges to work with their public workforce system to determine where were the job opportunities, what were the high growth industry sectors that potentially there was a need for graduates to fulfill, and then to also work with industry to ensure that the, the actual curricula produced was providing real skills that would be useful for that industry were two really important pieces to add to this, this initiative that I think worked strategically to the advantage of the program overall and have continued to produce OER that I think really is fulfilling both those requirements, leading to jobs in high growth industry sectors and teaching the necessary skills and competencies to do the job. And when we have OER that's focused on high growth uh, areas of the economy, is there some reason to hope that that OER itself could help accelerate the development of those industries? Absolutely. I, I think that what we're seeing now is that the way that this program was initiated involved not only OER and working with industry and the public workforce system, but it also involved the notion of stacked and latticed credentials. So this idea meant that students could enroll in a program that might be very short, but taught a very specific set of competencies that would allow them to be employable right away. But then as they succeed and that industry grows, they can come back and take an additional stacked component to the credential that would give them additional skills that then the industry can use to further grow that particular endeavor. And that kind of approach of entry points, exit points, entry points, exit points that build on one another and all use OER I think is a very powerful formula. And finally one of the other advantages that we're seeing is as the because the materials uh, for these job training programs are all open, the quality of the programs is much easier to assess because they are no longer uh, um, uh, black holes or uh, uh, closed doors where you don't really know what's going on inside the program. And now we're asking all of the educators and the job trainers who've received these funds to share their work. Yeah. And when that happens, uh, we see an improvement in the transparency of the programs. When the programs become more transparent, what effect do you think that has on them going forward? I think there's several effects, Hal, and I think one potential that you haven't mentioned that I want to highlight is we have a scenario here where we can create an end-to-end -end solution for students in particular that would take them from being um, interested in a job to knowing what the job opportunities are because now we have data that could be fed to the student and that transparency allows them to see where their real opportunities are to then being able to understand well if I if I want to pursue that job what skills do I need to have in order to take on that job and be able to match the skills required to the job prospect and then because they're now our OER to actually then look at educational resources that teach those skills and begin to assess your own skill set against those and also your own interest against those. And, and eventually even be able to then see, well, who created those OER and are they a provider in my region that I might consider enrolling in? And so you have this kind of trajectory of transparency at every step of the way that I think is a really powerful new way of thinking about how we engage students and how we encourage them pers to pursue particular careers that have a real impact on our economy. And some of the benefits can be even more prosaic. I had one uh, tact participating professor who had been using learning materials that she had produced in her class for 20 years. And she was happy to release them as open education resources as part of the tact program. So she put them online. And within two weeks, somebody in India, I think it was, uh, pointed out a, an error that was in the materials uh, that had been there for 20 years. <laughs> yes. And 
but because more people were now looking at the materials, uh, she was able to identify and correct the error. She was astonished that the error had been there for so long and that none of her students had ever pointed it out to her. Mm -hmm. But it was only when she shared the materials with a larger group of practitioners that one of her colleagues could point out um, a mistake that uh, had inadvertently been inserted. So the transparency can improve the quality in ways that you can't even predict. And I think we have a real potential now, Hal, to look at forming communities of faculty and instructional designers who all share a common interest in a particular sector, let's say it's health or manufacturing, across all the colleges who agree to collaborate and coordinate on curating a collection of resources that are relevant and useful for their courses and programs and then improving them collectively over time together to, to maximize the quality for all. One of the challenges around a program like this, Hal, is, is there's a grant fund allotted, it lasts for a certain period of time, and then what? I think in this TAC program, one of the exciting opportunities is to look at how this is affecting the sustainability of these college initiatives beyond just the grant duration. And I'll just highlight a few of the ways that I'm starting to see this happen. Many of the colleges and regions, because the grants have been state by state, are starting to think about their legacy. What's the legacy we're building out with these funds? How are rounds one and two being built on by rounds three and four to create a long-lasting initiative that will go well beyond the current grant duration? That's one thing. They're all thinking about legacy. I think they're also recognizing that some of these practices that you've been identifying are now being integrated into the regular daily workflow associated with how colleges do their work. And that's a transformational change that will continue on and on and on into the future. I think many of them are also looking to leverage their work against national competency-based standards that exist for many of these sectors such that the, the credential they're building matches up against a national competency standard and can continue to evolve and involve more and more partners from around the country. So they're starting to broaden their participation from say the single college grant that they got or a consortia grant to a larger collection of participants to maximize this over the long term. And for me the important thing to always remember is that open educational resources is not a product, it's a process. Yes. And once the funding for the product the, that's being created with an individual effort goes away, what remains is the process. And the process is the most important ingredient in open education resources. Right on. <laughs>